Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tabletop Theology, a lighthearted conversation about serious topics. I'm Abby Amiot here with Dr. John Bell and our special guest, Kendall Mullins from Wilshire Presbyterian Church in Denver, Colorado. Well, hi, Kendall and John. How are you guys? Hello. Hello, Abby. How are you today? Good. And what shirt are you wearing? I am wearing my Laker shirt as we are currently winning in the finals. It's a very exciting time. So, But, but you live in Denver. Yes. Um, I married a Lakers fan. So okay. I am now on that bandwagon. Just wanted to be clear. I had my Nuggets hoodie on all day, though. So okay. we're both. <laughs> That's good. That's okay. good priorities. Yes. Repping both. Um, so last week we talked about abortion, which was kind of our first of hopefully many intense ethical conversations. Um, so I want to take a little step back today and we brought Kendall because you're our resident listener on staff as well, but we're going to talk about listening today <laughs> and how we listen to people and how we have conversations uh, with people we don't agree with, um, which is very hard, especially today. I feel like it's just very hard. So yeah, Kendall went to an exercise, a webinar on uh, listening, and so we're zooming her in today mm -hmm. to tell us about that that exercise and uh, and how we might be better listeners uh, to people with whom we disagree. The Presbytery put on a fearless dialogue workshop um, that was quite powerful in its simplicity and we were asked questions and one person in the group had to answer the question and then everyone else had to ask questions of that person based on their response and that person could not comment they had to accept what was asked of them in love and care and just settle in that and had to listen and it was profound and beautiful. And the ability to listen without having to respond or to justify or to teach, um, there was a lot to be learned there. I think that's so, I mean, I love to talk. It's one of the reasons we have these <laughs> conversations anyway. Um, but there's another organization that Welsher has partnered with in the past called Building Bridges. And this is sort of their whole concept too of, of creating listening and active listening in dialogue as a means of connecting with people. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, I think we all know, like, oh, I need to listen to people who disagree with me. But especially today, that can be very, very hard because people who have really strong convictions about um, just very deep divides and very deep disagreement, um, that it can be hard to listen to that, I think. And I think in, it's easy to get into the divide and stay on your side. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd be curious for both of you, when was the last time you had a hard conversation with somebody that you, disagreed with and were you a good listener john i'm just trying to soak it all in you know we all talk about our enneagrams and our myers-briggs and um our birth order i'm a middle child i avoid conflict i think you two who work with me know that. Uh, I prefer to avoid conflict. So I don't wade into um, conflicted conversations easily or wantonly. Uh, but yes, as a pastor, I end up in um, awkward conversations. In this COVID time, it's mostly happened over email, which is, uh, the, the you know, unfortunate. Um, because I think email can be greatly misconstrued. I mean, mm -hmm. my before COVID, you know, if someone sent me a acerbic email, I would say, well, come in, let's have a cup of coffee and talk about this, or let's meet at Starbucks. And that was a much healthier dialogue. Um, during COVID, either you're in these Zoom uh, meetings with 20 people, 
and it gets awkward to have an individual conflict or um, it, it's just email, but um, even phone calls aren't very common these days, uh, at least for me. So um, how does, I mean, COVID's a temporary time, we hope, but uh, yes, conflicted conversations happen. Um, I've, ha I've had three or four email challenges to our tabletop theology and also my sermon last week. Um, and, you know, it's important to, um, well, first, it's important to respond. <laughs> it's, it's easy to, to, run, to run away from these conversations. So, so uh, you know, having the courage of your convictions and stating them is a very important process. And then stating them kindly, respectfully um, is another part of it. But uh, trying to understand, trying to listen, is uh is a difficult thing during this time I and mean, we're so po polarized mm -hmm. at this moment it's uh it's a challenge what did you learn kendall in your webinar about the polarization taking place they actually didn't um they didn't address it specifically um but just that it's important to have those conversations with people with whom you disagree. Um, and I think if, if we all look to do that, maybe there would be some coming back together um, and the divide would, would be um, made smaller. I think it was a fearless dialogue. So going into these conversations, with less fear, I think maybe listening would be a part of that, that you don't have to fix them or change them, but just listen. Um, I want to, I want to piggyback off of that because um, I have uh, many of my family, many of my friends uh, have very, very big disagreements with m me and my own convictions and um, my politics, my religion, however that works. Um, and I think the, the healthiest thing for us in those conversations, kind of going on that fear list, is giving each other the benefit of the doubt of uh, no one in coming into this conversation is um, trying to be hateful. No one is going to stop talking to each other after we're done having this conversation. We're all going to still be family. We're all going to still be friends. Um, and I think that's something that kind of goes with that fearlessness of uh, developing these relationships where you don't have to be afraid of having these conversations because the consequences aren't that big. Like you can disagree and not you're not going to lose a relationship over that and that's hard i mean that's very hard to do i think everybody uh, there are people that lose relationships all the time from deep held disagreements but i think um something that we've in my family tried to implement of this hang on everybody loves each other like come back <laughs> like we're all okay we all believe the best about each other and um and don't see that these opinions define who these people are um overall and that's something we've tried to try to do so, so I'll, I'll draw one boundary here and then I'll, maybe we should move on to listening to God, which is mm -hmm. another, another topic. Uh, nice. there, was a book, <laughs> there were actually a couple of books written a few years ago, uh, which have been very helpful to clergy. Uh, one was called Clergy Killers, um, about toxic people in the church who, you know, Abby, they're not family. They're not out to help you. They're they're actually out to destroy and hurt. And um, so there is there is a line um, at which uh, in the church we have to be careful of people who are out to actually hurt the church or hurt you know us. Um, and and they don't have the good intentions of mm -hmm. of the family. And I, I think there is a point at which um, we've got to to draw a boundary there. I, you know, as a pastor, I've seen that a number of times. Um, but in general, you're absolutely correct. If if there's an understanding that the church is family, and that we're all in this together, um, you know, dialogue 
is actually very helpful and very positive and listening is a skill which none of us have developed as well as we should. So I love that segue. This was our other topic of listening to God and discerning God's will, which is kind of the theology of all. Um, so this is a question for both of you of how did you know God's call in your life? Do you know God's call in your life and what led you there? If John comes out and says, oh, I have no idea. It's gonna be I, that's a rough one. <laughs> um, mine was an accident. Mm. Do you want me to go first, John? Mine, I'll make mine short. Yours is more yeah, long yeah. and Yeah, mine, mine long, long and boring and old. And <laughs> yours is fresh and new and exciting. I was in a stage of my life um, where I was in somewhat of sustained prayer asking for God's will. And I was at coffee with a woman who... <clears throat> was a mentor of mine and um, some of them, some of you watching know Holly Ingalls and she was leaving and I started crying because she was my mentor. I had no idea, but in hindsight, when I said, oh, you're leaving, you were my mentor. I wanted to be an educator. And then she said, well, you should talk to John. <laughs> and um, as I step back and reflect on the whole experience, I think that was God's answer. It was God's call on my life. And it just took me a little bit of time, but I do believe it was an answer to prayer. And I was in a, in a place of looking for, for that, um, trying to decide what to do. And I had never worked in the church before. It was, I just taught Sunday school. So um, that was my, my, I answered God's call, I think. And can yeah. I, I know that you love the Holy Spirit. That's something we've talked about. That that's uh, going back to our Trinity conversation. Do you did you really feel that you know the movement of the Holy Spirit? You and I both love signs. We both love <laughs> gut feelings. <laughs> was that something that you definitely experienced, or was it also just the influence of other people in there too? Um, I started crying. <laughs> I don't know what the Holy Spirit. That's, that's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that's the Holy Spirit usually. Um. I just, I, I think, I think the Holy Spirit, God was at work through different people who um, had been put in my lives for different reasons. Um, and it all just kind of came together. So John, I'm very you, happy that it did. Oh, good. Yes, we're happy too. So, uh, so, so, I, so I could just very, I'll, be as quick as I can. Yeah, did you have I, a dream, I, an angel? What came I to you? I could go like an hour and a half on the subject, but <laughs> you know, when I was uh, 15 or 16, um, I, I felt specifically God's call and claim mm -hmm. on my life to be a disciple. Uh, I, I would have considered myself a Christian before that. I always went to church, but I think there's a difference between thinking you're a Christian nominally and being a disciple. To be a disciple means to be an active learner, mm. to be a, a servant in the world. And I, I think when I was 15, 16, I felt that strong call. So that would be my first, what I would call, call. Mm. Um, then I majored in economics in college, but got to my senior year and had no idea what one does with an economics degree. Um, <laughs> unless there's a global pandemic and an economic tsunami. <laughs> you know? So, so I, my senior year of college, I prayed earnestly uh, what I should do with my life. And uh, I was in church one day and the sermon was on um, God's call to Moses at the burning bush, which is an important theme for Welsher too. And, uh, and I, I felt in that sermon, uh, that, you know, that was a call to me. It was, you know, I hope everybody's had the experience with a preacher. You feel like the preacher is talking to you specifically. And I felt like that Sunday, in spite of the fact there were 500 people there, he was talking only to me. Uh, and the Holy Spirit, you know, was, was coming through. So from that sermon on, I felt a call to ministry. And I've really never doubted that. I mean, I, 
occasionally, you know, you come home after a bad day and think I'm going to law school or, you know, <laughs> I'm going to drive an Uber. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm done with this, but nobody's uh, listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> nobody's listening. Uh, Kindle and Abby aren't paying attention. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I've really never, I mean, all my ministry, I've really enjoyed what I've done. I've felt, I've found meaning in what I've done. And then the call to Welsher um, specifically, uh, I, um, we were in the Southeast and uh, we were looking at calls all over the country and I just felt a real uh, love of um, the church, its music program, its love of worship, um, its spirit, its uh, the the hopefulness of the community—all these things really fit. Um, I believe my spirit. So I I've enjoyed my twenty, almost twenty-one years of ministry here, and um, I, I I think uh, John Calvin would say that. You know, when you feel the spirit, it, it's it's an inner certitude, mm -hmm. and I've I've always had that inner certitude, that inner complete confidence that the Holy Spirit has told me what to do, mm -hmm. um, and that hasn't happened many times in my life, but but on those big moments, you know, marriage, kids, call, ministry. I, I feel confident that the Holy Spirit has spoken to me in plain language. I love that you both mentioned prayer because I think, um, you know, I just remember like as in a college student of like, oh, what am I supposed to be? What is my calling in life? Um, it was a lot of seeking out mentorship. It was a lot of advice. Um, but I think that there is something to earnestly even, you know, we can have a whole nother conversation on what prayer is and the power of prayer, all that stuff in our theology. but. I think that earnestly seeking, I think that there is something about if we're presenting ourselves to God, God is going to respond to that to us optimistically, hopefully. Well, we could, we could, we should probably talk about prayer in one of these uh, mm -hmm. sessions, but you know, some people pray all the time, every day, all day long. You know, I, I tend to say prayer for, um, the big things and the big moments and the big decisions and the hard things. And, you know, um, it's, a, it's an inner life, so we don't talk about it out loud that much, but I, I couldn't have more confidence that God answers prayer. No, it, it's, it's very firm in my life. Kendall, what would you say? Wait, so can I ask for clarification? So you don't pray every day? I do pray every day. For for the big for the big things. Oh. I don't okay. I, I don't pray for a parking space at the mall. Okay. I don't I don't pray for a good dinner. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just sorry if I miss I misheard you. Yeah, Thank you. You can pray. I, <laughs> yes. I didn't say I didn't pray often. I said I just I really just pray for the big things. Okay. That's what I I interpret that as like just every once in a while when something big comes along, I'll pray. Sorry. Uh, that's no, my I, no, I know people who uh, literally pray for everything and pray without ceasing. I just Bible. pray without ceasing. Abby's got the first correct. That's not my style. I, when do I pray? I pray, we pray Good before question. dinner and I pray every morning when I get up. It's how I start my day. Um, I'm probably the person who prays for a lot of little things throughout the day. I feel like, like this morning as my son's throwing a temper tantrum, I'm like, God, <laughs> I can stop. I don't, I, mean, I don't think, I don't think that's a little thing. <laughs> I, you know, it's not so much, but, um, yeah, I also like to pray while I'm cooking dinner. That's kind of a time when I like to pray. It's the only that's time. A that nice, that's a nice, that's a nice thing. That's really yeah. nice. I agree. Pray for my kids, and it's like, you know, cook with love, right? Cook with prayer sort of works for me. I, I tend to pray in the car. Oh, I sing in the car, so. <laughs> Different. <laughs> I have a concert in the car. <laughs> so, so, 
how do you listen for God? Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to listen every day for God, and I don't know where. Um, I'm not a great faithful Bible reader as much as I would like to be every day. I don't, um, but I think that I would like to look for God in the Bible more than I do now. I'm trying to build silence into my life. Um, as I'm working on my mental health, especially during this pandemic, that's become um, very clear that I need a little more silence in my life. Historically, well, to, up to this day, I think um, I look for God in my life through other people. That's how I experience God. Um, not so much through worship or through music, though I'm through getting- preaching. <laughs> I'm getting better. I'm getting better at those things, at finding God in those things. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. People. I listen for God through other people. What about you, John? Um, silence. I think you're right. I, I, uh, I said the car. I said uh, my, my commute, you know, is some, you know, often 35 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, many mornings or afternoons, I'll just turn the radio off. And, and, you know, I'll have 30 minutes of silence. And mm -hmm. uh, I suppose meditation might be a better word than prayer for the, that time. And that's not the only time, but um, uh, that, that's a positive time for me. But I think silence is exactly correct because there's a lot of noise. We've had a COVID household full of people, as you know, and to find uh, quiet time is um, precious and, and important. To clarify, John's house is not full of COVID to all of our listeners. That's not what that meant at all. He has family visiting <laughs> during COVID time. <laughs> Before you get emails about that. <laughs> I, 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 miss, I misspoke. We've, got, uh, we've had numerous COVID refugees yes. uh, here. Perfect. COVID-free, uh, COVID-free refugees. COVID-free, yes. Um, I want to thank you both so much for taking the time. This was a lovely time of listening and talking, so I appreciate you both. Uh, we will be back with some more pressing topics, I guess, next week. We have to figure out what we're going to talk about, but I want to thank Heather for sending us the listening question. That was really great to kind of spur off this conversation. Um, as always, we love to hear from you. Feel free to comment, email us, um, and we will see you next time. Anything to add, Kendall or John, before we go? Thanks for having me. No, you guys are great. Great. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.